Uh, so, um, as John mentioned, um, I started the Collaborative Knowledge Foundation with Adam a few years ago. And I've been in and around the open science, open scholarship, open access community for well longer than I care to admit a long history, as John pointed out, probably dating back really to 1999 when I first heard um, uh, one of PLOS's founders, Pat Brown, speaking about the freedom of information. And that was one of the early phrases used to talk about open access. And at the time, I knew very little about open source, but I've come to learn since that open access really evolved out of an understanding of what open source could do in code. Why can't we do that with, with content? And then, of course, uh, open data and others have followed. Um, but it's been a while now, and I feel we haven't made quite the progress we thought we were going to make, and it's been slow. Um, and so one of the questions that I'm asking myself now, and I ask this room, is why? Why is it so slow, and what can we do to accelerate? So uh, first of all, one of the things that we tend to do, and many of the people in this room, and I've done this together, which is we bicker. We bicker about what we mean. Do we mean open science? Well, shouldn't it be open scholarship? Open scholarship is more inclusive, but open science rolls off the tongue. And isn't science really important? Don't we need it? Um, what do we care about the most? Is it open? Is it fast? Do we care that it's speedy? Do we care that it is complete? That all of the good things, the code and the methods and the data and all of the people involved are all communicated at the same time? Is it about publishing or is it about the research itself? Who are the stakeholders? Uh, where does the money come from? All of these things are discussed constantly in ad nauseum and I feel that sometimes we do more discussing than we actually do doing. Um, so if we look at the state of where we are today, uh, Piwawar et al. published this in, in PeerJ recently, and it's got a ton of amazing data. 28% um, of the scholarly literature is, is open access according to their very comprehensive work. 28%, given that open access really started being, becoming a, a term that was being used in 1999, 2000, is actually a pretty small percentage. Interestingly, over half of these, they, they labeled bronze, which essentially means they're open, but we don't really know why. Um, so what does that tell us? It tells us we haven't really sorted ourselves out very well at this stage. Um, we have a lot of confusing elements, tags that don't have meaning, things without tags at all. Um, we are, as at a grassroots level, fairly disorganized, and this creates a pretty uh, confusing picture. Um, on the open data side, this report was prepared by Figshare. Um, I think it's actually quite positive. Uh, there's a growing awareness of open data as a, an important initiative, as an important, con important concept. The, um, the willingness to reuse uh, open data sets went up from 70 to 80% over between 2016 and 2017. I think that's pretty impressive, actually. Um, one of the early discussions around open data, one of the early complaints was, we're going to make all this data open. No one's ever going to use it. You know, Who's ever going to use someone else's data? No one will do that because they want to collect their own data. And, and so I think that, that this is exciting. Um, what's interesting to me is that only 16% said they shared their data because of a policy. Um, and so that tells us a little about where, where the teeth are in the policy world. Um, more recently, this group formed uh, out of the National Sci Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine in the U.S., and um, this was a group that got was commissioned um, by the Arnold Foundation to discuss where open science was. And, and I found this a very positive forward step because these can be some fairly conservative organizations that are slow to move. Um, and uh, the report was strongly worded about the needs to um, for everyone to come together, for people to align and for um, open science to be done um, by design, which was good because I've been doing open science by accident. So I think by design is <laughs> helpful because now we have a blueprint, uh, we know how to do it. Um, and it, it reiterates what a lot of the folks in this room are already thinking about, but now it's coming from new sources. So this is a more top down in the US source. And I think that's interesting. And, and I think it's important because we're seeing more top down intentional open policy uh, initiatives, et cetera. Um, 
I think that in order to make more rapid progress, we need to think of the three-legged stool of policy infrastructure and community. Um, and it, without these working together hand in hand, what we end up with is disconnected or disparate efforts where my, great progress might be being made in one of these, but it's ne not necessarily being supported or perhaps even being undermined in one of the others. So I'll start with policy. And this is the area I know the least about, so I'll, I'll talk for the longest on that. Um, <laughs> so um, I pulled the, this data from uh, the uh, registry of uh, open access repositories, um, and it shows the different policies that are out there. And this is an encouraging graph, because from 2005 to 2018, there's been a significant increase in just the, ser the number of policies for open access, and huge growth in research organizations, institutional policies, um, which is phenomenal and very exciting. Um, and then, of course, most recently, Plan S um, in the European Commission, along with 11 other funders at the national level throughout Europe, um, have put forth a very strongly worded policy that all scientific works have to be freely available upon publication. And the policy includes things like a cap on APCs, and it also says no more hybrids. So this is a pretty significant effort, um, and it's got a lot of uh, publishers concerned. I was recently at the OASPA conference, and this was quite the hot topic. Um, but again, it's a top-down effort and um, probably one with more teeth than we've seen elsewhere. So that is, if you're an advocate for open science, that is progress. Um, I would say, however, that the policies that are out there are um, inconsistent. Um, they are all over the map. Some of them are focused solely on open access. Others are focused on all aspects of open science or open scholarship. Um, they don't always um, attempt to mandate the same things with the same timelines, with the same funding attached to them. Some have no funding at all attached to them. Very few of them are well enforced. So what we have is a misalignment here, and therefore a lot of confusion. Institutional policies are useful, but if you're publishing across multiple institutions, as many groups of collaborating researchers are, then you may have um, actually conflicting policies, and then funder policies and government policies on top of that. So while there's been an increase in this kind of top down um, policy making and potentially even policing of the activities, there is again at the grassroots level a lot of confusion and, and not necessarily as much compliance as we'd want. On infrastructure, this is the area that COCO specializes in. Um, we have a huge amount of activity happening. Uh, there are a lot of builders out there, and this is really exciting. Um, but again, I think that uh, where we, what we have is also um, quite a bit of confusion. Um, I uh, Just to, to elaborate on that just a little bit um, on the infrastructure side, um, if we look at what the industry needs today, the wider information industry, and I, in, in that I include publishing, I include uh, data management, um, institution, scholarly communications for institutional repositories, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what we've seen is an enormous amount of mergers and acquisitions, consolidation, commercialization. Just on the publishing side, which is my background, um, I believe that uh, a move towards more open and transparent publishing has been hampered by legacy systems, legacy technologies, commercial and proprietary toolkits. Um, that haven't evolved much. Um, in fact, we're still publishing like it's 1999 in a lot of cases. And um, we have an, an attempts to create more shared and open infrastructure have not always really borne fruit. The one notable exception, of course, is OJS. Juan, if you're in the room, I said I'd mention you. <laughs> um, so in addition, um, as Heather Joseph pointed out in this article, the increase in consolidation in, in infrastructure um, is potentially concerning if you are interested in, um, in key containing price uh, costs of infrastructure and enabling more uh, adoption of new tools. So as many of the common, commonly used platforms and tools are being bought up, by large commercial interests, this could potentially uh, go the way it did with content. So with content, we saw a lot of consolidation. And because of that, as publishers bought other publishers, et cetera, et cetera, when what we saw were, was, saw was a rise in costs and a decrease in openness of content. So if we imagine that possibility with infrastructure, what we may see is our infrastructure costs going up, 
and uh, maybe less innovation, more restrictions, um, and, uh, and, and that will end up uh, probably inhibiting things that many of us would like to see, like more journals transitioning, for example, to open access or more new efforts um, being launched. In addition, there is a sort of interesting question around infrastructure and data. Um, as uh, infrastructure becomes owned um, increasingly by different corporations, the question of the data, and I don't mean, mean the research data, I mean the data about the production of knowledge. Who's written what and when? Who collaborated with whom? Who did the peer review? What information was noted or annotated during that process? When was something uh, submitted versus when was it published? When will it come out and be available? That data, who owns that now? And I, I think with a lot of uh, you know, um, really sensitive information, potentially in the publishing pipeline, this data needs to be understood. This data needs to be protected. You know, researchers are counting on the kind of larger information industry, the publishers, their institutions, et cetera, to, to, to protect them as they produce potentially, you know, a new drug or a new weapon or something else is being communicated in that work. And, and that information being privately held by corporations who are owned by other corporations and everything could lead to some interesting and potentially uh, damaging consequences. So that hasn't really been well thought out. Um, on the community side, community is one of these words we throw around all the time, and it can mean everything and it can mean nothing. Um, but where I, where I think it's interesting as I look around this room, um, that FORCE has been a community since the early days when it was called Beyond the PDF. It's been a strong community of people who are kind of working towards change. And in theory, that should have gotten us far. And I feel it's, we're still struggling to understand how to work together to make the kinds of changes that, that many in the room have been hoping for. So the question is, what is the role of community and how do we actually leverage true community collaboration to affect change? Um, I, was, I was heartened recently uh, by the, uh, the, the group that came together under the heading of JROST, which is the uh, Joint Roadmap for Open Source Technologies, I believe, um, and echoed work that uh, COCO and the Code for Science and Society had started with the Open Source Alliance for Open Scholarship. And these two groups are both trying to unite open source projects together under a kind of umbrella where they can work together and hopefully be more interoperable, build together, use each other's projects, and maybe even communicate outward more effectively on what is available in the open source realm that can potentially um, be pulled together to create alternatives to the more commercially or proprietary held um, technologies. And then most recently, there have been discussions that move that into how was that be, could that be funded by efforts like the 2.5% effort, by some of the open research funder group uh, uh, participants, and how can we actually invest in creating a broad base of community-owned infrastructure, open infrastructure, that can hopefully provide really end-to-end -end solutions for people trying to um, produce knowledge, share knowledge, et cetera. So that is a, there. There is progress being made here. There is more collaboration, certainly in the last even six months, than I've seen prior to that. Um, I noticed, and many of you may have seen, that this declaration went up uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, meant for all of us to read and discuss about the ways in which we can engage, um, in particular, researchers. And I found this is an interesting topic because as we are a community, these are the kinds of conversations that we should be having. And we should be discussing what are the ways in which we can engage researchers as well as the other key stakeholders um, in this. Um, and I thought it was an interesting idea to dissect the top three worst things you can do to turn off researchers and prevent further engagement, telling them to share their results early, expecting them to help build tools, and ask them not to consider journal impact factor. And I would say I disagree with every single one of them. I think we should do the opposite. So I wanted to open that up, hopefully, during the Q&A. But in the meantime, I kind of fixed it. So. <laughs> I think the question is not how to engage researchers. I think the question is what can we do to make research more effective, right? We are all investing collectively in research. This is what we pay our tax dollars for. And so, in fact, we're the customer 
here as as far as what we we want to get what we what we came for right we came for better and faster and more useful product better research right we want the cure to cancer we want uh, well the UN report on climate change says we've got 12 years so we need speed right we don't we don't have time to worry about somebody's feelings about sharing their work early or whether it's in nature. We don't have that time, we don't have the luxury. So I think the question we should be asking and the question we should be driving towards is what can we do to make research more effective? And I would say it's rewarding the behaviors that we want to see. We want people to share early, but we don't reward that right now. And by we, I'm now flipping to funders and institutions and tenure and promotion committees and things like that need to shift rapidly and radically towards open, speedy, scientific, and scholarly research. And we, as a group, need to offer the channels for that. We need to offer the venues. We need to flip journals to open access, but also rethink the publishing process to be a lot faster and to have real data being exchanged real time to solve these problems. We will not solve them otherwise. And uh, a one-year timeline to, pu to publish a single article on climate change is not going to help us if we have 12 years. So that scary note. <laughs> um, so we need all of these things to work together. We cannot focus all of our energy on infrastructure. We cannot just sit around as a community and, and sing kumbaya. And we do need the policies to line up to really fuel this. Uh, we need policies with real funding behind them, policies with teeth. So at COCO, what we've done is we're trying to tackle our corner of the universe. Um, we've focused a lot on infrastructure and community, and we believe those two go in hand in hand. Uh, we started uh, three years ago with the idea that in order to really change the way research is communicated, the way knowledge is produced and shared, we needed to rebuild from the ground up a lot of the ways in which this is done. So we have a uh, technology framework called PubSuite, which is essentially a, a toolkit to build platforms. And um, I tend to think of it, because Adam is the technical one and I'm not, as a series of Lego blocks, which you can mix and match to create platforms. And there are a lot of them that are reusable. So we have a book platform, Editoria, a journal platform, XPub, and we have a micro-publishing platform as well. And many of the component parts, those Lego blocks, are actually able to be reused across them. And they all fit into this framework, which gives, gives a lot of reusability. And it also means we can hopefully meet new use cases moving forward. So if we collectively decide we need different forms of research communication and we need them to be faster and we need them to be more transparent and they need to be more data rich or more methods rich or what have you, hopefully this toolkit can help us do that and produce that and meet the needs of, uh, of research communities who are in fact actually trying to change the way in which they conduct their research. And we work within the communities of publishers and libraries and researchers that we encounter. And we do work with policymakers and funders and advocacy groups to try to keep what we're doing uh, in, in, a sort, in that context. And in addition, we really strongly want to collaborate with other open source uh, tool providers because we believe that there needs to be a full ecosystem. So this very modular system means that it's flexible and it's, you know, we can remix and rematch. And it also means that others can build into this uh, ecosystem or they can take things out of it and use them in other contexts. So anybody can just pick up a notebook or a piece of this, a peer review piece or um, a submission front end or something like that and use it in other, in other uh tools and other platforms. And our goal really is that to, to move away from this idea that there's one single solution or one single platform out there that's going to meet all the needs. That's been tried. It hasn't really worked. Typically, when somebody does that, it takes years to build, and then it's done. And the minute it's done, it's already out of date, and you need to start to change it. So with this more modular idea, you can swap things out in and out much more quickly and be much more nimble in terms of meeting future needs. Um, everything that we do is open source. Everything is MIT licensed, uh, including the work that we're getting through our contributing partners. And um, I don't think I need to convince this room that open source is a good way to build. I think we've got 
a fair amount of agreement on that. Um, but I will say that it is everywhere. It is in every phone you're using. It is in every browser. It's behind a lot of the tools and a lot of the services, including the web itself, that we use every day. Open source is everywhere. We rely on it constantly. And I get a lot of questions, particularly from publishers who are less familiar with open source, about its reliability. And, um, and to, to that I respond that you are using it every day. If it weren't reliable, you wouldn't, you, we, wouldn't, we would have no internet. Um, so an open source is growing even within um, the, the larger sort of information industry. Um, these are some of the platforms and frameworks out there that many of you know, and many also are building small specific tools that do point solutions. And the more modular we can think of this, the more we will be able to reuse each other's work, which I think is crucial. Because one of the big challenges I've seen over the last couple of years is a reluctance of people to reuse each other's code. And it sort of gets at the whole, why are we competing instead of collaborating? And I think that's a pervasive issue across this entire uh, effort. If we want open science to happen, we need to start collaborating rather than competing. And I think it's, it's very clearly uh, an issue in, in the technology world. Um, we have a number of amazing partners that we're working with. Some are here in the room. Um, we, uh, this isn't even a comprehensive list because we're adding people frequently. Uh, we're very excited to be able to work with these folks. And our goal, we, the way that we operate is to build very much collaboratively with our partners so that we're not building things with the hopes that it's useful to them, but they are in fact driving that build. And in some cases, for example, with eLife and Hindawi and Europe PMC, they're contributing code, a significant amount of code. Uh, so we have a very active active open source development community uh, with code coming in from different places. And it's working really well. And it's working well together. And that's an invitation to join. Um, uh, we think there are lots of ways to get involved. And there are lots of ways to um, utilize what, what's coming out of this growing community uh, of people. So um, how am I doing on time? Ooh. Running out of time. All right, I'm going to skip the little video. We have a little video all about our collaborative community, which is sweet, and you can find it on Twitter. <laughs> um, so uh, that's a really sweet story, and we love what's happening at Coco, but we're small and we're starting out, and this is in the beginning and early days. And in fact, what I see most often, and, 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 and I'm including Coco in all of this, is we pull in different directions. We aren't necessarily working as closely together. We aren't figuring out how to, how to walk together down the same path and eat off the same hay, as, uh, as opposed to going in different directions. And I don't think that this is out of uh, ill will. I think it's largely out of everybody's busy, and you've got your head down, and you're working on your thing, and you can't see that other person's thing, and you didn't even know it existed, and then you find out about it, but now it's too late because you did your thing your way. And, uh, or you get into a competitive stance because you're both going after the same funding or something like that, and you start to feel this angst, um, or you have this kind of rough edge, and they have a rough edge, and you don't quite match, and you're not willing to give up that little rough edge and smooth it over in order to collaborate. And so I, I, I suggest that we need to stop thinking of ourselves as a series of separate efforts and think of ourselves as a single movement, and that there is a unification process that can happen that happens with uh, social, cultural, political movements. Um, and so I started researching a little bit what that means, and I am by no means an expert. But I found that there were five steps, which is a handy place to start. Um, first, you unify behind common goal or goals. Then a lot of the activities and a lot of the mobilization occurs at a grassroots ground level and then begins to consolidate. And it is this consolidation wherein lies the power right, because then you're all working in the same direction. Um, at a later stage, there is typically some form of governance, some kind of structural organizational component that helps that consolidation turn into action, right, and helps people actually plan that action. And then with repeated action, the change occurs. And this is, this is a series of steps that works, whether it's a social movement or a cultural movement. There's an intentionality that comes at that consolidation stage that I feel we're missing. And so I started looking at some examples. Um, uh, there was a great Harvard Business Review, uh, Review article uh, juxtaposing Occupy and Otpour. Um, Occupy was in the US in response to the economic crisis in 2008. Uh, lots of protests, lots of activity, lots of occupying. Um, 
and uh, Otpor was a Serbian-based uh, protest to overthrow uh, Slobodan Milosevic's regime. And that started in 1998. So Occupy got started, lots of activity, and then it sort of fizzled. And some things continued and some things didn't. There were a lot of different grievances that were aired under this one umbrella. Odpor, on the other hand, had a single goal, get rid of this guy, overthrow Milosevic. And within two years, they'd accomplished it, which is a pretty amazing feat if you understand that regime at all. So you have these two here where one was sort of all over the map, even like the picture, what is she doing on the, on the ox? I mean, the, the, what is our one demand? They didn't even know, and they put it on their ads. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so you look at these two and you learn that, you know, this single purpose, trying to understand, even if it's not your primary goal, how do we get behind a goal and make some success occur? Because then you can serially continue and do more. Um, another, uh, a great example of both consolidation and governance is the women's suffrage movement in the U.S. anyway. This started around the 1840s. It had started earlier in Europe in the U.K. Um, and the U.S. movement learned a lot from those. Um, so the 1840s, there starts to be all of this activity, and it's going on in the U.S. across lots of different states. And they made progress in some states and less in others, as tends to happen there. And um, uh, it wasn't until 1913, so 70-some years later, that there a consolidation occurred under something, the National Women's Coalition or Committee. And they got organized, and they solidified all of the activity behind a common goal of the vote. So it had been a whole lot of other things as well, equality and all of these other issues. They said, we're going for the vote. And they uh, organized their activities across everything from throwing parades and parties in towns to hardcore lobbying Congress and putting a lot of funding behind that. And within a few years, they had the right to vote. So it took seven years, but given the long history, that was significant. So these are interesting examples. Um, and then the other thing that I learned um, uh, is that the, the organization function actually has a name called a backbone organization. And this is a real thing. Um, uh, I'm smiling at Karen because we came to this understanding <laughs> together at a certain point working on an, another Arnold Foundation project. And, um, and we learned that there are backbone organizations actually can effectively not necessarily, they're not necessarily always a deciding body, but they're more of a structural body that helps to pull data in across the whole range, give you ideas to, uh, for how to act, create actions, create templates for that, monitor that, uh, also uh, channel funding, uh, pull funding together and pool it and so that things can actually be uh, uh, working together. And the, the, another US-based example, sorry about that, but is the Tea Party movement, um, which is a conservative movement that started uh, in the late 2000, 2008, 2009, and um, uh, had a ton of amazing grassroots efforts that actually really did, were very effective in changing the dynamics in local politics all across the US. But they didn't really have a strong backbone organization, and then actually have not stood up under the Trump party kind of shift and have kind of dissipated. And so a lot of those activities where there was really strong uh, Tea Party groups uh, are struggling now. So it's interesting that you can see where some of these movements have not had quite all of the right ingredients, have had some and not others, and have had variable success because of it. So I think I will put a proposal forth, um, which is that we think of this process as something that we can actively and intentionally go through that we come up with a common goal. It could be any of these. It could be some articulation of all of these. It should be fairly specific, and it should be something achievable as an initial starting point, even if we know there are 10 other things we want to do. Um, it should be uh, something that covers uh, infrastructure, policy, and community. It needs to come from the people, but it needs to be concretely covering the range of different things. Um, and then I believe it really needs to have a strong uh, and thriving and funded backbone where people are actively, it is their job to coordinate all of us and get us moving and help us out and tell us what's working and what isn't and reporting back. 
And that is uh, what I believe we need if we are going to become an open science movement and not just a series of wonderful but disparate activities that are disconnected and not necessarily achieving our goals as quickly. And I really believe this is necessary because we need research to work, right? We need to research like our lives depend on it. So let's form a movement. Thank you. Now, I'm cognizant that there is wine and beer outside. Um, and so, <laughs> I, I will take questions, a few anyway. I see a question. Get him, Laura. Here you go. <laughs> This is really great, thanks so much. So I have a question about, you know, you kind of talked about these, these movements that have one key issue. And so my question is, what, how does a movement get its key issue but then continue to evolve and change? Because I think of, you know, votes for women, we got, we got the vote and then the Equal Rights Amendment came and it wasn't, we didn't quite get that. And you know, here we have, you know, all these other things, the Me Too movement, and we're not quite getting that. So how do you kind of grow over time to keep saying, okay, this is the thing, now we got that, but we're not, we're not done. We have other things and, and build on that. Well, what's interesting is a lot of movements don't. They don't actually survive and they don't evolve into the next thing well. Um, even the, the, the Serbian one fell apart, you know, in the post Milosevic era. Uh, and I think it was because they wanted all the other things at once. You know, they wanted everybody wants, okay, we had 10 other things, let's get those all done. And in fact, you probably have to be serial about it. But I don't know, and I think this is what we need, we need help, right? We can't just make all this up ourselves. Just doing some research, I realized how much there is written on this, how many people out there do this for a living, form movements, help movements happen. You know, again, if you invest in that process, we hopefully can avoid some of those pitfalls. But even if we get one thing done, it's better than, you know, half, a lot of half things. Questions? Oh, Daniel, want to get him? I'd like to uh, throw in a suggestion on how to combine those three things uh, by taking inspiration from the Wikimedia Foundation. Not surprising to some here. Um, <laughs> where, whose mission is to share in the sum of human knowledge, uh, basically. And then um, if we can think about how to adapt this to scholarship or science, we could just say to share in the sum of human scholarship or whatever. That would be a good starting point. And then, uh, Maybe it's not specific enough yet, but at least it's a starting point that's concrete enough that we can continue this conversation. I, I do think we need to be concrete. I would suggest that sharing in human scholarship is still not. That's more of a vision or even a mission. Um, and I think a goal is, you know, what, smart goals, it's measurable, I forget what the A. Actionable. Actionable, yeah, 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 all those things. Timely, right, so I think we need to be more specific. Um, and I think that that involves a hardship, and that hardship is it won't be the, the, the one thing everybody will. I mean, it'll have to be one thing, and not everyone will feel that that is the most important thing. That's the hard part. Articles in one week. That's a fine thing. I mean, I'm, I'm really starting to feel the speed thing may be actually the most important thing. That's just me, though. Um, so I thought uh, you said something uh, amazing. Uh, all of that was great, but uh, a key point is like, having someone or someones who can actually coordinate this movement and like fund it. Not just like, oh, this is great and I'm gonna do this as a side project, um, and, but it has to really needs to be like a corpus of, of people that are like, this is, going, what, this is what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna connect, I'm gonna do research on what's out there and try to connect these people. Do you know, uh, do you think that funders would actually fund such a corpus of, of people and uh, maybe we should write a proposal? <laughs> yeah. I think so, I do. I think that there is kind of growing momentum. There's consolidation of funders more. You know, We're seeing that with the Open Research Funders Group and we're seeing that with Plan S and we're seeing more consolidation there. So there may be that momentum. It might, we might be moving in that direction. Um, but, but without a common plan, what are they gonna fund? You know, We have to get ourselves organized. This top-down stuff like Plan S is coming in part because 
people couldn't organize themselves and do the right thing on their own. So they needed someone to tell them what it was. And so I think if anybody can make that happen, it's this group who can actually self-organize because there is the, the right motivations are, are, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have some of those motivations already. Hey, Kristen, Aaron Robinson from ESIP. And I, I think that I'm sort of uncomfortable, and I think that's part of the movement pieces that there's some kind of uncomfort that we're trying to go from uncomfortable to some some other place. But there's been some interesting research on collective impact and on backbone organizations and on the fact that backbone organizations sometimes actually kill the movement. Um, and the other piece of that might be on the funding. And I think that Force actually is a really interesting community because they haven't had an office or a back, you know, a truly funded backbone organization. So I think there's just a tension there that we need to be aware of and that it's not the end all be all. I think that's right, and I think there are cautionary tales there, but I also think that the lack of organization of a group, including this group, and the lack of any kind of structure isn't serving us. So I, I think that, you know, we are well-meaning, and, and, we um, and we are all working hard, um, but we are not working all in the same direction. And so I, I'm not suggesting that exactly that set of five steps with those exact things is exactly the right way to do it. In fact, I would love to talk to people who have seen every sort of action movement occur and seen what's worked and what hasn't. Tell us what to do. Um, but I don't see, I see it continuing on with the disconnected, misaligned uh, efforts is not going to get us there. So a change, in my min opinion, a change has to happen. Um, hi, thanks for the very great talk. Um, you just talked about the Plan S uh, in Europe, and um, and of course, yes, it is really well structured in Europe and well uh, financed the movement for open ac open science, open access. Um, I was just wondering, how do you see the link between? Um, your uh, final slide, let's form a movement, and what's happening right now in Europe? Well, I think that what I would suggest is an answer to something like Plan S, right? Because Plan S is a policy. It's, it's, it's not an implementation plan. <laughs> it doesn't tell you how to get there. Um, and it is, uh, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's, it's a policy. And if you don't have the implementation, the infrastructure, the services, the path forward, uh, that's managed, it won't, we, won't, we won't, it won't get there. If the community doesn't get behind it, communities don't understand what it means to them and how to action it, it won't, it won't necessarily come true. So I think that, um, you know, we need the, the full three-legged stool to happen there uh, to make it, to make it work. And I, I'm not sure if the Plan S organizers, teams, authors, are necessarily doing all of that, the rest of that. Um, but I do feel that there is certainly, it's sort of the broader open science community, force in particular, there is a potential for the, these great minds to actually formulate the plan for ourselves rather than having it come from above, from the EC or some other entity that may or may not understand the nuances that we understand. And we actually have more on the ground knowledge and collectively more experience so it should probably come from us. Or if it doesn't, we'll continue to get hit with mandates that are p only partial solutions, really. I mean, Plan S is an open access plan. It doesn't talk about everything else. So, so uh, there's been a lot over here. There's been a lot of talk about us and we. And, um, uh, and to a certain extent, uh, a movement sort of can exist independent of us or we. You know, there was the Arbor movement and there was the hygiene movement. And we're still benefiting from those movements at the turn of the, not the last century, but the century before it. And and um, and and I'm interested to, that you were you were distinguishing between science and scholarship. You know, to a lot of lot of lot of what we're talking about here is getting scholarship out, getting scholarship available, and and there's been a lot of discussion about getting scholars tenure, but. Um, uh, Umberto de Boni at, at Toronto did an analysis of the, the last 10,000 graduates of our graduate program, and only 15% are working in academic institutions. But they're trained as scholars. So how do we transform the open science, open publishing system to allow people to be scholars regardless, regardless of where they are by publishing uh, observations? 
Well, I'll just sort of respond to that last point, which is, um, uh, but first of all, I don't, I, I see science as a subset of scholarship, but that's just me. Um, and so I, we use scholarship because it's a broader term and more inclusive and includes all the people that are doing all this different part, aspects of research. Um, and so it's a better term. It's just open science has kind of become a phrase. I think that we are lo we're losing a lot of people out of the, the, the academic side of scholarship, I would say that there are probably a lot of people here in the room that started down a path uh, to become scholars of some form or another and now are doing something a little different but still have the, the, a scholarly approach or a scholarly mentality about that and, and some are still scholars. So I, I, my, I guess my question would be is how do we, if we want to change the way research is conducted and, and then communicated, Maybe we can engage the citizen science worlds, the various other types of people that are doing really interesting things and elevate that, and raise the, the potential there. Uh, that may be a way to, to uh, achieve a goal of increasing the amount of, of research being done and increasing the amount of, of the visibility of that. I, just throwing that out there. But this is all part of getting that plan crystallized because um, we wouldn't have time in a session like this to do it. This needs to be an ongoing activity where people are able to say, this is one of the many issues we could solve with, uh, with, by broadening you know, the, the, the concept of open scholarship. Okay, last one. Hi, fantastic talk. Um, it certainly resonates with a lot of the things that I've seen in other movements that I've been part of. But I think one of the things that I've noticed, and you sort of alluded to it earlier in your talk, is that we do love discussing or bickering about different things. And I think one of the things that we might bicker around is what is the right backbone organization to help support this sort of work? So I wondered if you had thoughts on what the shape of a backbone organization that might work for this movement. Let's call it, um, actually, I don't know what. Well, that is, I mean, part of it is we don't agree on labels and we don't agree on words. And whatever we pick in terms of what we call a movement and whatever we pick in terms of a backbone organization, I guarantee half this room will not want it and not like it. <laughs> so in a, in a way, it sort of stops mattering, right? It, it, you just kind of have to do something. And, and if you lose some people along the way, well, maybe you'll get them back in a little while you know, and you just hope for the best. Because, uh, you know, we can't just keep bickering. It's the time is over for that. Well, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>